Here we are at Wangaratta Cemetery, which opened its gates around 1862. But wait, people started moving to Wangaratta around 1840s. Where did they bury the people? Well, it was here, a free block of land near the river. This is the monument that was erected in 1926 in remembrance of those that were buried here. Sadly, no one is really quite sure how many people are buried here, and the ones they do of are listed on the side of the monument. Note that this will be the first of many little pop-ups in the right-hand corner that'll tell you a little bit more about the person on each headstone, or in this case, on this monument. Well, now that we've got that sorted, best we go into Wangaratta Cemetery. This is a war memorial listing, everyone who has served in the area. Let's start in the Lawn Cemetery, or as sometimes I like to think of it as the Lawn Filing Cabinet of the Dead. So what if you perhaps don't want to be in the Lawn Cemetery, but you want something close to nature? Well, here you can opt to have a tree, and as you can see there's some plaques underneath the trees. This one kind of looks a bit more like a stick than a tree, but we do have to remember it is autumn. So Wangaratta Cemetery is pretty big. Uh, I don't really want to undersell that, but it is pretty big. So I'm just going to show you just the sheer size of the Lawn Cemetery. I can't help but think it kind of looks like large dominoes. And a small part of me has this urge to want to try and knock them over to see if they all fall down. Here is the memorial wall. You may have seen one in my Cobram video. The best part of this one is that you can see the shelves that the ashes get slotted into before the plaques get put on. And, I don't know, to me it kind of looks like an old post box that you find at the post office. So this is the children's section, and I hate showing children's sections because it's so unfair that children sometimes die. But it was the sheer size of this one that sort of caught my attention. It's just shocking to see all these small headstones lined up like this. These are the war headstones. There are six here uh, from World War II, but there are four others from World War II scattered around the cemetery, and there are five from World War I scattered about as well. Unfortunately, this one has fallen down. Uh, luckily, someone was kind enough to reassemble it like a jigsaw so you can still somewhat read what it says. So if you look to the right, you'll see the article about how Frederick died in a car accident. I just love how simple this headstone is. It's exactly what you think of when you think headstone. This is a Catholic reverence plot. I quite like the fence. I think it's quite pretty. So you can see that they're not all buried here. Uh, some of them are buried around. But I wanted to talk to you about William Healy. Um, there's a little bit of an explanation on the plaque in the centre. Uh, his headstone is the top right one. And it might be best if I do this while I continue to show you around at the other stones. Note that Healy's pop-ups, like the little bits of information, are going to be on the left-hand side, and uh, the headstone pop-ups will still be on the right. So I'm going to read you his plaque, which gives you a little bit of inside 
to what makes him interesting. Reverend William Healy died in the Wagga Wagga Jail on the 6th of August 1876 from gunshot wounds received in a tragic encounter with police. Immediately buried as a pauper in Wagga. After intervention by residents of Wangaratta, his body was eventually exhumed and reburied here on the 4th of November, 1876. His story has a worthy place in Australian legal and, I'm going to say religious history, because that's what that word means and it's easier than trying to pronounce it. So what's the full story here? Well... I guess to some extent you have to know a little bit more uh, about Reverend Healy himself, who is described as being somewhat unhinged in the mental persuasion and enjoying of lots of good drinks. He was an Irish priest who travelled around a bit. Anyway, he found himself in Wagga at some point and the police identified him as being someone else, a fellow by the name of Turner, who a couple of weeks prior had uh, stolen some tobacco and some clothes. So when he went up to his room, they came up with their guns and knocked on the door in whatever fashion they tend to do it back then, which I don't know, uh, where they're like, you know, Turner, Turner, come out, come out, I assume. And obviously he didn't answer because that's not his name. So they busted in and they shot him in the arm and chest, I believe, and then dragged him off to Wagga Lockup for the night where he died. Then the police caught the real culprit, Mr. Turner. But by then it was too late and Reverend Healy had been placed in the ground at Wagga. It didn't take long for news to spread about what had happened. And, well, to say Wangaratta was furious, for those times may have been a touch of an understatement. It really rattled the Catholic community. And they were perhaps the ones that really pushed to have him brought back and treated with the respect he perhaps deserved. I suppose the other part of this you need to acknowledge and in why it actually says at the bottom of it his story is worthy in Australian legal and uh, religious history is because perhaps it rattled the Kelly family more than most and it's considered a relevant aspect to the Kelly family history and how we know Ned Kelly today and perhaps he might not have turned out quite the way he had if that story hadn't gotten to him and that family to reinforce the idea that police were bad And it was completely okay to go up against them. So if you want to perhaps know a little bit more about Ned Kelly and how this relates to Reverend William Healy, uh, then it's actually in the Ned Kelly book. And I'll post that to the left so you can see the book I'm talking about. I wanted to show you these headstones because they're just the stones and there's no uh, beds. And the big one is Nicholas Lay. Now, Nicholas spent so much time in the newspapers over the years that it was easier to show you a screen with a a sample of some of the reasons he was in the newspaper than it was to show you them one at a time in the corner. Nicholas was pub owner in Wangaratta. And for every person that owed him money, he also owed others money. Besides that, he was an active member of the town and was often a good point of call for the police in the area with any investigation. He was noted in a suicide report as having brought the situation of the man to the police's attention shortly before he ended his own life. But one of my favourites of Nicholas's articles has to be Allowing a pig to wander. Nicholas Lay was charged with allowing a pig to wander in a public place. Dismissed. So even the judge thought that was just silly. The other one I find somewhat amusing is Nicholas had to ask the public in the public notice for permission to use a kiln on his allotment, so his land, for an allowment of bricks. From what I understand, he was going to use those bricks to build or 
add on to one of his existing pubs. But the fact that he had to submit a public notice, I thought was just bizarre. So have you ever noticed the dots inside the letters once the metal lettering has fallen out? It's actually there to hold the metal in. From what I'm given to understand, they carve out the holes as anchors, basically. So when they pour the lead in, uh, obviously the headstone's lying flat at this moment in time, uh, it settles in and it holds better and it lasts longer. It was the font of this one that caught my eye. It looks like someone made a headstone-shaped mould and then when they poured the concrete in, they squished little letters in to get the writing. And then once it was all dry, they pulled it all out and painted it white. It looks really good, even if it is a little bit strange. Now, I don't quite know how Asian writing is supposed to look. Let's face it, I am not of that type, so I wouldn't know. But to me, the Asian writing at the bottom of this headstone looks a little bit squishy. But the headstone overall, look how cool is that? With the little spiky edges and then the black to highlight. It's just, it looks so good. So you may have started to notice a little bit of a pattern with me where I just love good stonework, like where you can see the skill that had gone into it. And I think this one is a pretty good example of that. Just the hollow part um, between the reef and the cross. Wow. Josiah and George Dale are brothers who share this plot. They were amongst the earliest to be buried here at Wangaratta Cemetery in 1854. Note that the headstone is sandstone, not granite, which would have been a lot easier to source at the time. So if I've wasted your life, well, that's your problem. If I haven't wasted your life, you better click subscribe so you can get more videos like this.